How are you, Tawana? Hi, I'm doing well. Good morning. Good morning. And we can stop sharing the slide, Hannah. Be good. Thank you. All right. Now I can see if face. We've never actually met. Tawana? No, no, not except over email. Oh, I'm so happy to see you here. Can I just start with how are you feeling? Uh, you know, I, I'm feeling as well as can be expected with all the things that are happening in the world, right? Um, you know, I, I, before we even go on, I'd just like to lift up that my conversation today will be in honor of, of Timnit Gibru, who was unjustly fired by Google um, today. And that is pretty much uh, on everyone's mind, a leading, leading voice in ethics. Um, across the globe and so we should all lift her up and send her positive energy uh, she was terminated for doing what we all aspire to do and be all right yes indeed if we should all be supporting her she's an amazing person she's super talented um i i feel that it's a reflection of the toxic culture in tech and it's also the fact that we all need to be supportive of women especially black women in these environments and these toxic cultures because if we don't who will right that's we all right. need absolutely yes that's been weighing on all our minds as well so um so thank you for joining us and we are so um honored to have you so i will start off with just a quick introduction of your background tawana for those who are, most folks know you already but i will just give a quick introduction you are a mother, a social justice organizer, youth advocate, author. You're a lot of things. Uh, you're also a water rights advocate. You're a digital and data privacy education and racial justice and uh, equity based advocate. Uh, you're based in Detroit. Um, you're also a non resident fellow with the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford PAX. You're a convening member of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. You're a former fellow um, of anti racism and an act anti-racism facilitator with Detroit Equity Action Lab. And um, in all of this um, this world of gloom and doom, I, 2020 has been hard for a lot of folks, but what gives me hope is we have been seeing some good news. And one of the good this uh, spotlights was uh, you recently joined the Data for Black Lives as their national organizing director. So can I just say I'm so thrilled. It is so exciting. Congratulations on your new role. Thank you so much. It's, I'm only a few days in, but I'm super excited uh, for the opportunity. It is right in lockstep with my principles and values. And so I'm um, looking forward to deepening my relationship with the organization. That's wonderful. I think it's such a wonderful fit. It's a great organization. Uh, how about we start with, could you just help us walk us through what the organization does for those of who um, uh, and the audience who don't know about it? And also, uh, what the, what is your role uh, within the organization? Yeah. So I'm only I'm only three days in, so I would I would love to not be the voice of the organization just yet. But I would encourage folks to go to d4bl.org. And, you know, clearly as day, the, the model on the uh, website is data as protest, data as accountability, and data as collective action. And so I am a data and digital justice and privacy advocate. Um, I co-founded our data bodies as well as uh, directed the data justice program for Detroit Community Technology Project for several years. And... Um, and uh, I look at this as an opportunity to scale up uh, nationally and more internationally the work that I'm already doing um, and also still prioritize Detroit because it is a predominantly black city that is suffering under the weight of a lot of these systems that we are trying to ethically undo. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. And the reason we invited here today, just to stay, just um, to layer the context is we need to have this much needed and this timely conversation around why we need to rein in the surveillance technologies because they are everywhere, they're pervasive and they're having an 
a destructive impact on communities, especially the black and brown communities, the ones that you're trying so hard to protect. And we've seen time and again, we've seen data that these program surveillance programs do not work. They only tend to, and yet there's so much money being poured into it. So I'm glad that you're here. We can have an open conversation. And now with your new role, can you talk a little bit more about what does it say about your personal journey and how it culminated, but also about what does it mean for the social justice movement? Like, where are we? Yeah, so I, I'd like to uh, first say that, you know, the surveillance systems are working for the folks who innovated them, right? And so, you know, they, they put them out under the guise of safety. And one of our main focuses is to push back between the conflation between surveillance and safety, right? Um, it, it, it serves as safety for maybe property um, and wealth for those who are already wealthy, but it does not serve as safety for communities who are being hyper surveilled and criminalized. And so um, through the work of our data bodies and uh, Detroit Community Technology Project, we were very clear that uh, we learned that our communities wanted to be seen and not watched. And so these technologies serve as a mechanism for continuing a very long legacy of surveillance. Uh, Simone Brown in Dark Matters talks about the 18th century lantern laws where if you were uh, a black person and you weren't in the presence of a white person, you had to carry a lit lantern in front of your face. Um, and so when we look at mass surveillance programs like Project Greenlight in Detroit, which has over 2,800 surveillance cameras in just the Project Greenlight real-time crime center coupled with face recognition, as well as private entities who have their own surveillance cameras that are being utilized by law enforcement. We know that that continues a very long legacy of surveilling black, brown, indigenous, and, and even poor white communities. And so this new role that I'm in is an opportunity to continue um, and expanding on the already brilliant work that Data for Black Lives is doing um, and tapping into the network that already exists across the globe and trying to find some synergy between our organizations and our work so that we can um, you know, tackle these uh, issues um, more collectively. The breadth of the surveillance technology and just that it, it's just mind boggling. You have to wonder how did we even get to this space? It's because it feels like we sleepwalked into this the surveillance state right that we are in right now. And there is no way to decouple these technologies that we seem to tout as innovative from the racist backgrounds, right? Our historical historic racism, it's all embedded in the systems. So uh, you co-founded our data bodies. Can you share a little bit more? Was it was there a instance or some incident that led to the creation of this? When, what sparked it? What inspired it? Yeah, so um, the our data bodies was really a collaboration between a lot of on the ground organizers, including myself, who are in the communities who represent the communities that they serve um, and were consistently experiencing or hearing from community members how they were feeling like these systems were not representing them. Um, we primarily focused on three cities, Detroit, LA, and Charlotte. And there was this running theme that our information is being extracted and leveraged against us. The smallest mistakes we make in our lives are being are trailing us to every aspect of our lives, whether it be a credit score or you know a w water being shut off or not for inability to afford it. Um, it could lead to condemning your home. Um, whether if, if you were uh, in a neighborhood that was consistently profiled and you ended up in the criminal justice system, um, that incident or those interactions with law enforcement continuing to trail you, just this perpetual looping cycle of injustice that tends to keep those who are in poverty um, in deeper poverty. And so um, our data bodies uh, decided to do some digital defense. Uh, we created a digital defense playbook with some tools that we were learning from community members about ways that they were surviving these systems. Um, of course, we kept some of that information 
privately because we want them to continue to survive these systems. But we learned through our work and we knew from our own experience that the the, the deep experts um, of how to undo these unjust systems are the folks who have had to survive them. And so our data bodies was inspired by uh, the community members on the ground who were telling us that we're, we're being watched, we're being tracked, our, our, our data bodies are being leveraged against us and we don't even have access to the information that these corporations have um, for our own benefit. And so it, um, several years long uh, project um, is continuing forward. I have retired from active organizing around our data bodies, but it, it continues on. And we now have a community member in Cape Town, South, South Africa, who is also participating in the work. And so um, it, it is very important that we think about the impact that our data has, not just on us, but on our family members, on our neighborhoods, how decisions are made in our communities and how this um, biometric extraction uh, is creating a social credit system in the United States. Um, it, we already see the impacts of that in China and other places. It is a global problem and we really need to tackle it as such. And what is disturbing is the fact that community organizers have been flagging this for a while. Yeah. It, it just seems like the black communities were flagging this for a while, but no one was listening. Mm -hmm. like nobody was paying attention. Um, so it seems like the work that's being done um, the, in facial recognition. So I'd like to just switch gears and talk about specific technologies here. Uh, one of them, which is most um, that Joy Bolivini and others have done, Timnit Gebru, who's uh, done the seminal work along with Deb Araji about facial recognition technology. Do you mind talking to us a little bit more about like just how harmful that is and also in what ways is it harmful and where are we with just the uh, policies uh, and just the governance around facial recognition technology? Maybe we can just talk about Detroit, but we can expand it if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I'm deeply grateful for their work um, in, in unearthing this uh, historic, uh, uh, legendary research that, of course, you know, folks that didn't look like them tried to discredit, but uh, were soon discredited in their opposition. Um, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that work, as well as the uh, work of um, uh, Claire Garvey and her team um, at Georgetown Center for Privacy and Technology. If it wasn't for that work, we would not have known, number one, that face recognition was in Detroit, and number two, um, what those potential harms were. As you may, may know, we have two of the first known misidentification cases in the United States uh, with face recognition technology and law enforcement. And so um, we have no doubt that there are many, many more. Like I said, this is a predominantly Black city that I live in, and their research showed us that it would misidentify darker skin tones. And so I'm in a city full of darker skin tones. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, not only do we have face recognition technology in Detroit, we have ShotSpotter, which is a technology that captures audio over a several mile radius and deploys law enforcement into communities. Um, so it's, it's capturing the voices of everyone in the neighborhood um, for a matter of minutes, as well as deploying, you know, law enforcement to areas of folks who have not committed any crimes. Um, we also have uh, Project Greenlight, the mass surveillance uh, uh, a system that is monitored by law enforcement uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week in three real-time crime centers. So imagine Batman having three bat caves with uh, uh, eyes on the entire city, except he's not going out um, uh, on behalf of the public. Uh, he's going out um, on behalf of the tech corporate giants. Um, and so uh, we are, I'm very optimistic in the organizing. We've seen a lot of cities uh, ban face recognition. Um, they have been predominantly white, um, but however, I've learned a lot from those organizers. And I think that we have had the benefit of applying some of their strategies and then adopting some of our own to try and push back against these systems in Detroit. We know that we have an uphill battle because the city is predominantly black and there isn't really a political will to unsurveil uh, black and brown populations. But uh, even last night, I was on a charter meeting till 1130 at night 
Um, we're trying to amend our city's constitution to get mass surveillance out of our city and out of uh, law enforcement and government hands. So there are a lot of policies on deck as well as challenges to the city's constitution. Uh, the community is very actively engaged um, in resisting. And, um, and we've been politicized uh, tremendously over the last several years. And so if anything comes out, of, if there is a silver lining to any of this is that the community's knowledge around this issue has been drastically increased. And I think that that is uh, very important um, in how we think about not only alternatives, but how we can come into the fold of helping to shape some of these systems for the future so that they can be uh, more ethical and resist uh, racism um, and uh, the tentacles of white supremacy, sexism, and all the isms that have infiltrated um, our technological systems. Can I just say kudos to you and all the organizers? Because it feels like there is so much disinformation out there and just general lack of awareness that even bringing this into people's like consciousness, making them aware of what the issues are in a meaningful way is so powerful because it's so easy to dismiss all of these issues because of this information being passed out there and we talked about conflating of security issues like how do we keep people safe versus being surveillance as being surveillance technology as being peddled as a necessary evil in some ways that you need it you really which we and you're setting the record straight which i really appreciate there so we want to move during the next uh, three days of events, we want to move folks from talk and to action, which is why your experiences in your guidance is very uh, critical here. It, you lead, um, we've included a link to your book towards humanity, shifting culture of anti-racism um, organizing. And we are also doing a book giveaway because we do want to support you. So folks, uh, I think there's some confusion about whom to send your request to. Um, we will um, please do send it to trustee or who is marked as a co-host and we'll take care of you. And uh, could you talk about how can folks apply this? They got the book and how should they go about applying it in their lives? I have a comrade who uh, talks a lot about um, getting grabbing five of your friends and, and bringing your vision to life. It, it doesn't. Uh, and then I have another comrade who says it's better to be an inch wide and a mile deep than a mile wide and an inch deep. And so um, I'm always thinking about those small collective efforts, right, that we can do that that kind of uh, turn into the, the sort of mycelium under the earth um, where it's rooted and it's deep and then, you know, your tentacles connect. And so just small conversations with one another, uh, deepening the questions, um, um, asking asking about each other's humanity, right? We don't have enough conversations about the impact on the system of white supremacy on all of us. It is not just, it does not just have an impact on black and brown and indigenous people. It has an impact on white people. It doesn't allow you to be fully human and to, uh, to recognize your full humanity. And I think that um, being stuck on this kind of, um, this uh, privileged, underprivileged kind of seesaw of anti-racism organizing has prevented us from having a deeper dialogue. And so I have made a commitment that I'm going to pull away from that type of language because if I teach, um, which a lot of white people come to my workshops, I told you about that. And, um, and a lot of them are, are white elders, which I think is important. These are elder folks who are asking deep questions about this po political moment. And I teach them that if I convince you that you are inherently privileged in this society, then that means I have to teach black and brown children that come into this world, that they come into the world underprivileged. And that has the psychological impact of telling someone that they're born into the world underprivileged, uh, it, it does a, a great disservice uh, to our humanity and, and the progress that we can be making. And so it's a small version uh, of the book, booklet. I'm working on the expanded edition. I hope to have it out in January. And um, I'm deeply grateful for anyone who takes the time to engage with it. I'm definitely looking forward to reading that and hopefully someday take your course as well. Uh, could you tell us more about uh, your workshops and you, any instances that stood out? Um, um, 
uh, during these uh, workshops that you mentioned, and I was planning to ask you about this, like what drives them? What has been the driving force for these folks? Was it protest? Is it the work that you're doing? What is raising the consciousness of um, the white community to come to your workshops and just build, build their understanding? Honestly, I think it, uh, from what I've learned, and I, I've probably engaged with over 10,000 in just the last maybe five years, right? And from what I've been learning in that time is that there's been this desire to also tap into their own ancestry, but a fear of having pride in who they are because of who they are. And I think that whenever you squander a person's ability to dig deeper into who they are as a human, it prevents them from being fully human. And so a dehumanized person isn't going to know how to treat me as fully human. And so that is my whole goal. My whole goal is to get um, white folks and all folks to be thinking about number one, the impact of anti-blackness, number two, the dehumanization of white supremacy, and number three, how to tap into a legacy and a lineage of folks who were abolitionists that look like you, you know, that are white people um, that look like, you know, I tell them that look like you, that, that you're, you don't only have a legacy of violence and lynching and slavery, there are also folks in your legacy and lineage who cared about anti-racism, who were abolitionists, who were uh, fighting against unjust systems. And that is going to be as significant as knowing about the people who caused the harms. And so um, one of the things that inspired me was that often I would ask um, white folks in the workshops, like, so who are some of your heroes? Who are some of the folks you look up to? And they could never name a white person. And to me, I think that that's incredibly um, uh, sad that you can't uh, think of a person who's doing social justice organizing um, that looks like you um, immediately. And so, you know, my goal is, uh, of course, listen to Black people, listen to the folks who are most marginalized within these systems, but also you have to be able to look yourself in the mirror and see yourself in this work. If you don't see yourself in this work, it will be optional always. It'll be a pet project. It'll be something you jump into when you have time. And I, I need folks to know that every day that we wake up should be a commitment to uh, not only ethics, but um, undoing racism, challenging anti-Blackness, challenging uh, Islamophobia, challenging homophobia, challenging all the phobias and the isms that have prevented us from being the people that we should be. Beautifully said, agreed. It, there's two things that stand out for me. One is, I've always believed that the onus shouldn't be on the marginalized communities to fix the problems that were created by privileged communities. So that's one. So there has always been, so I like the fact that you have more white folks joining these conversations because we'll need all of them all of us to come together to make this happen. It can't be just to the black community to fix these problems because these weren't created by the black community or the, uh, the, the, um, so the marginalized community. So there's that. The second is about how do you, um, I, I've noticed that um, losing a uh, train of thought here. So within this um, discussions, as you're framing up your discussions, one thing which we all have in common and we all struggle with is how do you align our dependence on technology, the Amazons of the world or like big tech, right? We are so dependent on them. Like I can't imagine a single person like in this audience who might not be using one of these technologies. At the same time, we know some of the harms that the technologies that they're creating perpetuate. What is your guidance to how do you balance those two? Yeah, uh, by pushing for these uh, technologies to be accountable, right? A lot of folks, uh, I get, you, would, you, you probably can imagine some of the ugly messages I get when I challenge face recognition and all these systems. I'm always getting messages from folks who will say, well, you have it on your cell phone. Well, I have it turned off to the best of my ability on my cell phone, but um, you're using this and you're taking photos and you're uploading this and you're uploading that. And it's not about telling people that they shouldn't have access to these systems. It's about making these systems accountable to us. And so we shouldn't have to hide out and disappear because they don't know how to treat us right. You know, and so um, 
that that's why the tenets of the world are so important. And um, and although her termination to me is um, a, a bit predictable because there these types of co uh, companies are only going to let uh, ethical visionaries go so far, right? Um, but we need to really support people like that who go into those companies and try to hold them to account because if they're going to exist in the world, then we need to figure out how to make them exist in the world on our terms. And so that that's how I um, that's how I get with uh, with that idea of um, you know I'm going to use this computer, but that doesn't mean this computer has a right to use me. Very well said. Agreed. We did not make this pact. Like it's not a suicide pact. We are not going down with you. It's also about you can, um, what do you say is so powerful, especially with Timnit's case. She has been such a vocal advocate. She has always been true. She's, she does, what is powerful about folks like yourself and Timnits of the world is when you work for a corporation, there is this tendency, there is um, underlying um, pressure. There's this pressure to yeah. just color within the boxes. You can only go so far. You can speak out about technologies only against technologies or on, on the ethics, as long as it doesn't harm our bottom line. Right, so you cannot, so to be bold and say that I'm going to look out for the humanity versus corporate best interests, it's a very hard thing to do. And she's done that and kudos to her and yourself and others who take that vocal stance because it's not easy because you said it's the harassment, it's the messages, the retaliation. Um, these are deep pocketed uh, folks. And uh, the, these are not like, the powerful, they're powerful privileged folks. So I, and I the hyper surveillance and the hyper surveillance of the folks who speak out, right? Like and the doing of the protest system. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. They're using that against the protesters. It's just this, this massive effort to just shut things down. And so I appreciate you bringing that to light. Um, you have so some folks I've read your interactions with some folks I follow on Twitter, obviously, I come to your feed to get inspired. <laughs> because I'm just all in awe as to have you continue just forge forward on these issues, um, indomitable spirit. It's you've laid out an alternate vision, right? You have a vision in mind because a lot of folks cannot even comprehend what does a world without surveillance even look like? Because that's supposed to keep us safe. It's the same thing. This um, what is being politicized? Defunding of police. Right. It's like it, it's a slogan. It's a it's actually a policy position, but people just think, oh, it's a fancy slogan. We should come up with a better slogan. But there is, right? There is this historic like um, there's a background behind it. It has history behind it. It's not just a slogan someone came up with. So, right. can you share your vision? Like, what does the world without surveillance really look like? Painted for folks are like who are struggling with that, who, who can't use that, can't even imagine that. Yeah, and and I'm fine. I'm and I'm also glad you brought up the defund police, right? I didn't hear a lot of crying when our schools were defunded, right? When neighborhoods, grocery stores were defunded, and you know, other community mental health supports were defunded, and so it's just it just baffles me while there's why there's so much resistance to pulling from these hefty, weighty budgets that um that have law enforcement officers responding to conditions that they are not qualified to respond to and saying move those resources over to those areas you've already defunded and refund those areas and so anyway that just really gets under my skin but um i'm, I'm thinking a lot about uh, i'll use detroit as an example we have a, a campaign um that we don't do as much online with the campaign as as we um started out to, but there's been a lot of community circles uh, and those small um, opportunities that I talked to you about earlier of community members uh, coming back to their front porches um, and, and just literally moving back to the culture of seeing each other. So it's called Green Chairs, Not Green Lights. Um, and so Project Greenlight being the mass surveillance program and Green Chairs, Not Green Lights being the counter campaign that's literally going door to door to to neighbors and talking to elders um, and other community members and saying, do you, you know, do you remember a time when you actually felt safe? And very rarely do they name law enforcement and they never name surveillance. 
And so it's really kind of tapping back into the village mentality of if the elder across the street from me is coming in late at night, I should probably watch them in the house. If the young person is walking to school, I should probably see that they get there. You know, and it's, it's really is looking out for one another and moving away from this culture of these apps that report on quote unquote suspicious characters and, you know, just all of the, the, the type of surveilling that we've bought into with or without face recognition. We've really created a culture of surveillance and individualism that needs to be countered. And uh, Dr. King in the 60s called for the radical revolution of values where we prioritize people over profits, machines, and property motives. And we have unfortunately not answered that call. And we've allowed corporations and private businesses to, um, to surveil our communities for their profit. And many times they don't even contribute to the community that they're surveilling. And so, um, so we're, we really, our alternative vision is to get back to, to knowing one another, to, to, to stand on the front porch or sit on the front porch for a second. Don't drive right into the privacy garage and, and bypass your neighbors, right? Get back to knowing who lives in your community, who has needs in your community, and how can we make sure all of our needs are met? And when you reduce quality of life issues, you reduce quality of life crime, and that is how you get back to seeing each other and move away from the culture of watching and surveilling. Thank you for that. I think that just opens up people's mind. I hope it opens up people's mind to visualize a different world than they used to because it feels like we have we've adopted the corporate mentality of just outsourcing everything. We just like our so safety, humanity, caring for each other. There's an app for that. And we need to come back to more community-based, um, whether it's community-based, organized, community-based. Um, safety, uh, community-based, uh, just uh, taking care of ourselves, just self-care and uh, being, we, we, we can do it. The question is, will we yeah. <laughs> do it? And that's where we need to go. So honestly, I believe we will. Yeah, <laughs> I'm an eternal optimist and I believe when I have conversations with folks like you, it gives me hope that yes, <laughs> possible. A new world is possible and we can do this. So thank you. Uh, on a slightly different note, so in our three-day event, we have invited artists. We have Suzanne Kite, uh, um, Ginger Chen, Leah Coleman, who will be talking about how AI and art can um, coexist and how one can feed the other and so on. But um, we also have activists like Meredith Whitaker, who will be talking to tomorrow, another formidable hey. force. Yeah, I love her. Um, so you organize an annual event, right? So let's talk about Petit Propolis. Pro did Propolis. I say it? Propolis. Propolis. Okay, Petit Propolis and you, it's um, led by you artist incubator, is that right? Are you leading it? Please talk, talk yeah, to yeah, I have an advisory board too. Um, and so, so what it is, is, uh, so propolis is the blue, is the glue, excuse me, that the bees create to protect the hive. And it also translates to a defense of the city. And so um, I am a poet named Honeycomb. That's my nickname. That's been my nickname since high school. And so it was just very fitting and petty is just my last name. And so to me, um, that's why I came to the consensus of small collective efforts being necessary to seal, protect, and keep us, you know, together and safe. And so, um, Petty Propolis is, is what the name came out of. But I organize an annual artist festival and artist retreat um, in historic Idlewild, Michigan, which is um, it's historically a Black cultural. Um, uh, how should I say, like vacation resort area in Michigan, that it was where a lot of famous artists um, went when they could not, Black artists went when they could not uh, go to other areas uh, when they were relegated and segregated outside of like predominantly white institutions and areas. And so they were performed there um, and they would vacation there with their families and they would take the Green Book um, which was a book that was created to, to show where Black areas that were safe, um, where they could go. Um, and so um, I am part of the, what we call the next gen Idlewild culture of rejuvenating that area and bringing artists um, into the historical aspect of Idlewild and also giving them a respite. The, you know, the artists that are creating, um, uh, contributing to revolutionary ideas, um, and, uh, and just uh, respiriting the world because that's what artists do. Um, and so giving them a respite um, and then opening up a festival 
to the community for free. And so um, this would have been my third year doing it, uh, but COVID had other ideas, but we hope to regroup next year. But we also teach anti-racism workshops. We teach literary and literacy workshops. Um, we do panels and, um, and other uh, teach-ins and, and other things. And so i um, really grateful to have that opportunity to use my art. I've been a poet since I was seven years old. So or I've known I was a poet since I was seven years old. And so the opportunity to not only cultivate other artists and poets, but create a space for um, already existing artists and poets, herbalists, historians, um, et cetera, is, is really a dream come true. It sounds wonderful. And someday I hope to be able to visit that in better times, I hope, someday. Uh, I, I love that we are bringing in different aspects of social justice because art plays such an important role in social justice. Like you said, I think we underestimate that. And it sounds in some way we are reconnecting with our past because everything is connected in some way to our historical legacy, right? When we are talking about technology, we talk about art and the role of art and previously social justice movements. So uh, I'm thrilled when you're bringing all of these elements together because there is a tendency to compartmentalize these things. But it's beautiful when it all comes together at the nexus. Um, could we, um, could you share some more about like who are the folks you look to? We look to you for inspiration, right? We look to you for our, for guidance and just when things are down, like I do, I know I do for sure. And many others do. Who do you look to when, for inspiration? Who are some women leaders that you admire? Oh, this is so complicated because I am not going to name all of them. And, and, and I don't want to be in any trouble for that. Please, please know that if you are not named, you are thought of, but uh, of course there's Ruha Benjamin and, um, uh, Monica Lewis Patrick with We the People of Detroit, um, all the women uh, and, and uh, gender non-conforming organizers with our data bodies, um, uh, named Timnit, Joy, Deb. Um, ah, there's so many. There, there's really so many. Uh, Mutali. Um, um, yeah, there, there's so many and I'm on the spot, so I'm not going to remember them, but oh, Data for Black Lives, yes, she um and the team over there and so uh they're they're just really really a lot of oh and the women at detroit community technology project <laughs> um um i've just had the awesome opportunity to be in fellowship with so many tremendous women who are just really front line back line middle line organizers activists mothers uh nurturers who have given their life to the struggle for our humanity and our civil liberties and, and justice. And, um, and I, I feel very privileged to be um, engaged in that type of uh, a network uh, uh, of women. And, um, and so it, you know, it really does baffle me when I see a lot of spaces that don't have like a lot of women of color or black women uh, lifted up as being like these revolutionary thinkers, creators, innovators, because that's all I'm surrounded by. And I said, where are these people going to get their information? I'm confused, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it, there, there's so many to name and I'm lift up my mom, you know, my mother who, uh, you know, she, she isn't in any of this stuff, but if it weren't for her, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be thinking and doing half the things that I'm engaged with, you know? And so, yeah. There, there are so many to name. Um, there are really so many to name. And, and my late mentor, Grace Lee Boggs, uh, I had the honor and pleasure of sitting at her feet many times and learning a great deal from her. And so there, you know, there are just many more that I could name. And my apologies in advance for forgetting so many of you. <laughs> Oh, we, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it's <laughs> always great to know who who inspires our heroes, right? It's always as a, who the person that you all look to look up to. But um, I agree. I still don't understand how we still are in 2020 and we have these panels which are all male. That's that's one. It's all white male, or it's all men, or it's all white women or it's a mix and I never understood I mean so many amazing people and um, just wanted everybody to know we have an entire directory 
devoted to that. And now you can actually put a filter in there because there's a tendency, even when you go into a directory, they just pick out, okay, there, suddenly you find women from the directory, but again, there are no women of color here. So we started adding filters. So you can nice. ask black women, LGBT. So um, it's been my pet peeve as well. We are trying to address it in a tiny way. We are a very small organization. We're barely just getting started, but- um, Everything maybe. starts somewhere. Indeed, indeed. So um, a question for you, we have a few, we do have some more time. And I wanted to just check the chat real quick. We haven't, we are not having Q&A, but I wanted to see if anyone has any questions for you. And we can pick those up. Let me see. Just oh, of course, for all the dads. My dad, my dad was one of my biggest role models. He, he passed at nine, but he's one of my biggest role models. But yeah, if we're lifting up women, I just want to make sure that I, I, I always lift up my dad. <laughs> I, okay, so here, so folks who missed my, the starting keynote, I started this initiative when my dad passed away in 2018. Mm. And uh, I still remember when I was a little girl, he would paint my nails. And I don't know a lot of men oh, <laughs> who so do that with the little girls. And I was just, yes, yeah, so that he, when he passed on and I wanted, I was questioning what is my legacy to the world? So this initiative is my legacy. So yes, dad's yeah, we, we love our dads and we also um, J for male allies because we couldn't do a lot of these things which we do without their support as well. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. Um, so there are some uh, folks who are asking about like technologies that we use in our daily lives, right? Can we talk mm -hmm. like, about the doorbell technologies? Everybody is has the, the what is going on there? How yeah. do you stop these folks? It's it's a mindset because you have this easy access and they're selling it on this will keep you safe. Mm -hmm. Does it really, because I, because there is no research actually to support it and keeps you safe. What do you think? It, it's a culture of fear, you know, um, and you, a lot of these companies have partnered with law enforcement to, to give these out to residents, you know, and so, um, it, it really is where we really have to get, uh, a trail on the money. And I think the, the deeper we get into knowing the origins of these, these innovations and ideas um, for our safety, then the clearer we'll become on the fact that it, it is not, has never been the goal, right? For the people who purchase them, of course, you, you're purchasing it because, or you're accepting it from law enforcement because you feel like this is um, going to be a, a mechanism for your safety. But the folks that are giving it to you, that is not their their goal. Um, and so um, I had read, um, and I haven't done a lot of deep analysis around a ring because I've just had my hands so full with all the other uh, um, issues that we're dealing with in the city, but um, that they're, they'll be programmed at some point to automatically identify quote unquote suspicious characters and call law, law enforcement for you. And if that is the case, I want folks to think about how quickly they're automating racial profiling when they get a ring doorbell and allow for the system to start to identify suspicious characters, suspicious characters in quotes, nine times out of 10 means someone with a darker skin tone, which is going, going to most prominently be black. And so you're looking at every black person that walked past your porch or, you know, um, or, or for whatever reason comes up on your porch um, could be a delivery person or whatever, um, being caught the law, having to engage with law enforcement, which we know a lot of times ends up deadly, uh, for, for black communities. And so really you have to be thinking about when we engage ourselves with these technologies, what the purpose is and who is going to be harmed and impacted by these systems that we're creating in our neighborhood. The only folks, like you said, who benefits from these technologies are the ones who develop these technologies. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. The rest of the, the rest of us seem like pawns, especially consumers who are sold on it. Uh, do you know of any policies that are in place that are to control how the the, ne the nexus between technology companies and how they choose to work with law enforcement? Like something we, we can look to, like what's happening. You mentioned you alluded to it at the beginning of our conversation. So, so how are we governing that? 
the content. I mean, there there are a lot of bills out there, like no biometrics uh, ban, a lot of federal, state, uh, and local legislation that pretty much has went to those uh, legislators and kind of kind of pretty much kind of sat at this point. Um, and so we're hoping that you know, with a shift in administration, that there will be some political will to move some of these things forward. Um, but we'll see, you know, the, the, the establishments have uh, historically been pro, you know, surveillance, policing and law and order. And, um, and, and, you know, I'm not overly optimistic that they'll do it without uh, increasing our resistance and our, our push and our challenges to these systems. And like I said, in Detroit, we're working on trying to amend the city's constitution. And we're on these meetings till 1030, 1130 at night. Um, um, trying to get uh, our, our, our charter changed, which will impact our city for the next 20 years. And so a lot of things are moving through, um, but we're getting resistance from police unions. We're getting resistance uh, um, from uh, local officials who have bought into the conflation between surveillance, security, and safety, um, and think that the only ways to uh, create safety in the community is to hyper surveil and criminalize and lock everybody up. They're not, they don't have the political will or the imagination to see that a community that is in deep poverty, that doesn't have viable grocery stores in the neighborhood or recreation centers for the young people to play or enough, you know, just enough food and resources and mental health supports. Um, they don't have enough imagination to see that those funds could be better used to create those things that can minimize those quality of life issues and reduce the quality of life crime. And so um, we're gonna have to stay steadfast um, and consistent uh, and push um, in through next, into next year and beyond if we have to, uh, to change some of these policies. This is the, I, I've never seen a greater opportunity to be honest with you. We saw the entire world rise up in defense of black lives. Uh, and so if we don't, if we don't capture this moment, I'm not sure when we'll have another one. Agreed. It needs to be translated to now some meaningful action, which is sustainable. Completely agree. You said something very key there. You talked about, can we talk a little bit about the conflation between security and surveillance? Do you feel there's so much funding, right? There's money involved. There's a lot of money involved. Mm -hmm. We talk about what goes to the law, law enforcement, what goes to tech companies, what money is being passed on private prisons, right? They all benefit from it. So when you have to deconstruct all of that, where do you, where are you focusing your efforts on? Because the reason there's resistance, because all of these folks will lose that revenue. Right. So they are going to fight tooth and nail, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, that is a huge revenue stream. So you said you're working on the, the changing the constitution, more bills, more governance and such. Uh, but what about the incentive structure? Is there, do you have any thoughts on how does one change the incentive structure, which is in favor of keeping the systems in place? Yeah, you know, my greatest hope is in the people, to be honest with you, um, the politicizing and raising the consciousness of the people, because uh, if we focus on the folks who are, want to hold on to those systems, then we'll have exhausted most of our effort um, and folks who have already made up their minds. Um, we might convert a few to our side, but for the most part, raising the consciousness and scaling up the community members who are gonna resist those systems is gonna be most important. I, I think about you know a, a good book and a film, uh, Slavery by Another Name, which, um, which a complimentary film to that, uh, of course, is 13th. But I think about, you know, when slavery ended and there was no will for folks who were used to owning people to come to the side of liberty and, and freedom. And so they created all these other mechanisms to hold on to their free labor. And now of course, fast forward and we have uh, mass incarceration and everyone knows that that's a failed experiment. Everyone knows that it ended up costing more money um, to incarcerate, even though there's still free labor involved, but this is a system that really um, has, has really destroyed many a community and family. And so um, I just have to have faith that the folks who have this consciousness, who have learned from these historical examples are going to get to the point where, you know, these, the vision 
uh, of the folks who are holding on to those violent systems is not going to be strong enough to keep those systems. And only then can we create an alternative that benefits everyone but you're not going to, the, the, the folks who are holding on to those systems are, have to have those systems yanked from under them in order for them to have an imagination uh, for something that something else that could be. The folks who uh, wanted to hold on to slavery didn't have an imagination for something other than that. You know, they thought that slavery was the end all be on. That was the way that the, the system had to work, they, that the way, the way America had to function. But the, slave, the enslaved populations who had never seen freedom imagined freedom. And they imagined that there could be a world with freedom, even though they had never tasted it. And that is the type of rigor and vision that is going to drive this, this, this change in this system as well. You know, we don't, we don't have to see it to know that there's a better way on the horizon. And those are the folks that I'm most, um, most willing to be committed to. Absolutely. Absolutely. That makes sense. Uh, thank you for that. There was a question about uh, specifically technologies. So there are technologies that can be, there's a technology question and there's the underlying, like the context in which it's used, the purpose and what it's used. So there was a question in the chat about can these be, can ethics be embedded in commercial software? And if so, how? Well, the ethics have to be in the people who are creating, <laughs> who are creating the softwares and the systems that you, you know, um, I feel like the build it, the build it, they will come, um, has been expanded to build it, they will come to our side. Um, and I think that uh, there hasn't been enough uh, stopping and asking questions. Um, number one, does this need to exist in the world? <laughs> Uh, number two, who's going to be impacted by these systems? Uh, and number three, will I have the will to slow this down if I find out people are being harmed? And I think that those three questions are not asked enough. There's kind of just this, well, it's already moving forward. We've invested too much money. And, um, and so now let's see if we can fix it. But we know systems like face recognition, as an example, there, there is no fix for that. If it's used by government and law enforcement agencies, whether the algorithms are accurate or not, those systems are going to be leveraged to harm these communities. And so you can't make a perfect algorithm um, and launch it onto a community of color and then say, well, the algorithms were fixed. Our hands are washed of it. Whatever law enforcement does with that system that's on them, we gave them an accurate system. You know, and so... It's really, really the radical. I go back to the radical revolution of values. We really have to start deepening our questions if we're going to get rid of, uh, as Dr. King said, the evil triplets of militarization, extreme mil uh, materialism, and racism. And I, I'd like to lift up a toolkit called uh, that I was uh, grateful to participate in the creation of called uh, Centering Racial Equity Throughout Data Integration um, through the Actionable Intelligence for Social Policy. And so that's another um, resource that I think that folks who are trying to, um, you know, if, if you say embed ethics, um, at least um, be thinking about centering racial equity within the process of innovation from the very beginning and start deepening those questions before things are created, before you start to build. What you've laid and out. And I'll drop a link in there. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we've been sharing links throughout, just so you know, so folks can follow along. What you have laid out is this counter vision to what tech companies have always been about. Silicon Valley has always been run, move fast, break things, ask for permission later, because they can afford to do that, because it's not their lives that are being broken. There are yeah. other lives. And I love that just your vision lays out how we can counter that effect. Yeah. Thank you. They're saying break things. They're not seeing. They're not. They're not yeah. seeing that those things are people. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know? They're not seeing that. That's exactly why we need more of your voices. We need to elevate your voices. And um, one thing we, I think, um, Hannah was trying to signal that we are out of time. But well, I could talk to you all day. Obviously, <laughs> I would love to uh, invite you to the AMA and the folks who have questions for you. If they want to move on to Twitter, we have you for about 15 minutes on Twitter. Is that right? Yeah, because I have a one o'clock Eastern um, meeting. <laughs> uh, we'll take whatever time we can get with you. 
Uh, we will then join the, you can continue this conversation with Tawana Petty on Twitter. Tawana, thank you so much for taking thank the time. You. Please take care of yourself. And thank uh, you. we are here to help and support you in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.